The boundaries between Earth's oceanic plates are alive with seismic activity. Ready to trigger one of the deadliest natural disasters known to man, a tsunami. Jesus Christ, look at that. When monster waves hit coastal populations, kidding, kidding, kidding. their power is unstoppable. This earthquake and the tsunami is much larger than they had thought could be generated at that subduction zone. Multiple assaults carry loved ones away. We're hoping against hope that they're still alive somewhere. Inundating land for more than three miles. Life has gone. The place has been destroyed. And leaving a catastrophic death toll. If they'll still be finding bodies now, I would imagine they would never have recovered everybody. Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? December 26th, 2004. Deep below the waves, off the western coast of Sumatra, the sea floor was ripped apart by a massive earthquake, measuring an average moment magnitude of 9.2. That was one of the 10 largest earthquakes ever recorded, and it was the third largest since 1900. This earthquake ruptured a huge fault. It was about 1,200 kilometers long, um, all the way up along the subduction zone in the Sumatra region. As the fault unzipped directly opposite Aceh province, its capital was rocked by powerful tremors. The panicked residents of Banda Aceh flooded into the streets as their homes crumbled. But the worst was yet to come. Millions of people around the Indian Ocean were about to be overwhelmed by one of the deadliest natural disasters in recorded history. The earthquake violently shoved the seafloor upwards at a speed of 10,000 kilometers an hour. This is one of the classic tsunami generating earthquakes, they call it a subduction zone event where two plates grind against each other, one's pushing the other one down, and, and then it essentially flips up and bang, that generates a wave. A very large subduction zone earthquake might displace the water by four or five meters, which might not sound like all that much, but it's doing it over hundreds, if not a thousand kilometers area. So it's a major disturbance to the ocean's surface, and that's a lot of energy. The displaced energy transferred into the surrounding water, triggering a powerful wave. And that wave, because it's in deep water, doesn't really have anything to slow it down, so it's going very fast. We're talking 800 kilometers an hour. The tsunami sped toward the Aceh coastline. Those who could fled, but for many, it was too late. The torrents of water and rubble dragged thousands to their deaths and continued to surge inland. It's not just one wave, it's multiple waves. And they're coming at a coastline with such force. And when they inundate or flood that area, they can travel up riverways, they can travel up other bodies of water. 
And in particular, in the case of Banda Aceh, it actually came from two directions. It came from the west and also came around from the north. So there were accounts of people who ran one direction only to find that they were facing the tsunami coming from the other direction. Comprised primarily of fishing communities, most of the immediate victims in Aceh were women and children. A lot of the women and children were located close to the coast. So the children may have been in school and the women may be at home or working in agriculture. And the men may have been out at sea fishing. <laughs> Some of those fishermen may have been completely unaware of the horrors unfolding at home. A large tsunami in the open ocean might only be a couple of meters high and might even go unnoticed by ships at sea. But when it approaches shore, it undergoes a phenomenon called shoaling, where all the energy that's in that deep column of water gets compressed. So you have what's a small wave in the deep ocean, about 50 centimeters. And then when it's coming on shore, in the case of 2004, probably about five meters high. Some of the waves that hit the northern tip of Sumatra exceeded 30 meters, flattening the coast. However, the island was just the first in the firing line. The tsunami was speeding toward Thailand, where beach resorts across the south were packed with tourists enjoying an end-of-year vacation. The tsunami travels about the speed of a jet plane. So if you imagine flying in a jet plane across an ocean basin, that's about the speed a tsunami travels. Although that's enough time for a proper warning system to deliver a warning to communities, it's not that much time. Unaware of the cataclysmic rupture 500 kilometers away, holiday goers at Patong Beach in Phuket witnessed a strange phenomenon. The sea was receding. As the tsunami approached, water was getting pulled back to feed the wave. That wave is building up. The one behind is pushing like crazy. This wave is getting bigger and bigger. It's slowing down. That crest is growing. And then suddenly it turns around and starts coming back towards you. And it comes in so fast, you cannot outrun that. An hour and a half after the earthquake was first registered, the tsunami hit Thailand, where tourists in Phuket bore witness to the wave. I was fine. I knew I was high up. There's a good, strong building. The, the waves were rolling. I thought, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. Jesus Christ, look at that. Jesus Christ. It wasn't a wave. It was just solid water behind it, and it just kept coming. That wave oh is a good God. 15, 20 feet tall. Easy. Oh Nothing was going to stop that wave. It breaks a long way offshore, so you just have this roiling mass of hell, you know, up to about five metres high, zooming towards you at about the speed of a 5,000 metre Olympic runner. So, can you outrun that? Just hit, and there was devastation. Boats getting smashed everywhere, people being washed away, uh, just carnage. Water rushed into hotels in some cases, inundating the third floor. Rooms filled up in 30 seconds. One of our friends had to throw the TV through the window to climb out. There's cars gone through shop windows, trucks being blown over. The destructive power of the tsunami was unstoppable. Each cubic meter of water weighs a ton, and the waves from the Indian Ocean delivered 100,000 tons of water to each one and a half meters of coastline. And the power is unbelievable. Just back there, there was a, a, a tractor, and it's nothing against the power of the wave. The event is chaotic because a tsunami destroys everything. It doesn't pick and choose. It doesn't say, oh, I'll leave that house behind, or I'll leave that kid behind. 
He was lost for two hours. The flood washed him away by himself. What and he you? hung onto a door in the hotel until the water came down and came out two hours later. Of the Thai areas hit, Khao Lak suffered the worst, with 4,000 perishing. But the tsunami would continue, sweeping across the Bay of Bengal. Two hours after the earthquake, and 1,700 kilometers from the epicenter, Sri Lanka was next. Resorts near the coastal city of Matara were assaulted by waves. It burst through the door, and we were lucky in other rooms, it burst through the whole wall and just washed in, at which stage we just left everything and ran. When Sri Lanka was hit, a railway train on the coastal line was crowded with passengers. At the village of Peralaya, the first of the gigantic waves arrived. The train stopped as water surged around it. People felt that the train was going to be a safer place to be than to be on the ground. Not necessarily a very good choice. It's a bit like people being in a car when the tsunami comes. You know, a car's full of air, a train's full of air, it's easy to pick up and throw around, and that's exactly what it did, essentially. And probably in the region of about 1,500 people were drowned, crushed. <laughs> In terms of the death toll, it became the world's single worst train disaster, adding to a confirmed death toll of over 35,000 people. <laughs> An estimated 90,000 buildings across Sri Lanka were destroyed. The southeastern part of Sri Lanka and the south part were the worst hit, most definitely. Uh, you could see uh, inundation going well over a kilometer inland. A lot of the tourist hotels on that part of the coast, you couldn't see them anymore. It was just a layer of rubble disappearing into the distance. The seismic shock of the 2004 earthquake rang the earth like a bell, causing the entire planet to vibrate by as much as a centimeter. It was recorded as a moment magnitude 9.2 event, a scale used by seismologists to compare the size of earthquakes. Magnitude's a number that's logarithmic, and what that means is every time you step a magnitude unit, you're increasing the motion by about a factor of 10 and the energy by about a factor of 30. Before the moment magnitude scale was developed in the 70s, we really relied on the amount of shaking that was observed in an earthquake to determine how big that earthquake is. But the moment magnitude scale is important because it relates to actual physical properties of the earthquake. It's proportional to the area of the fault that ruptured in that earthquake and also the amount that fault moved in the earthquake. The Sumatra quake was the third most powerful ever recorded. However, a tsunami triggering event in 1960 released almost three times the energy. The most powerful earthquake ever recorded is a magnitude 9.5. It's called the Valdivia earthquake, which came in sort of southern central Chile. On the 22nd of May, South America was throttled by a quake lasting over 10 minutes. Rubble and ruin in the Pacific port of Concepcion in Chile, where she has suffered the worst series of earthquakes in all its history. The 
problem with that vent was that it was so big that it was outside anything that had happened before. Waves up to 25 meters assaulted the Chilean coast. There's a big debate as to how many people died in 1960 in Chile, anything between about 1,000 and 5,000 people, which is a huge range. Bearing in mind it was not a particularly well-populated coastline, that's a lot of the population, because they simply couldn't get away. The tsunami waves would continue to propagate across the Pacific. Waves were recorded 10,000 kilometers from the epicenter, as far away as the Philippines. It killed people in the United States. It killed over 100 people in Japan, 61 people in Hawaii. Uh, it inundated the coasts of New Zealand. It was a phenomenally big event. As with the 2004 Sumatra tsunami, the Valdivia event was triggered by a megathrust earthquake. Megathrust earthquakes occur on boundaries between oceanic plates and continental plates, where you have the oceanic plate subducting beneath the continental plate. And in this region, you can store a massive amount of energy over a large area. That ocean plate that's diving into the Earth's mantle, it actually does uh, uh, gets bent through a quite a large angle. That causes huge stresses to build up within that plate. When that stress is released, it does so violently. So you get this movement of a huge fault at shallow depths beneath the ocean. And that's what causes the tsunami. In 2004, the earthquake and resulting tsunami killed an estimated 230,000 people in 14 countries around the Indian Ocean. Part of the reason for the horrific death toll, people were not aware that a tsunami was coming and didn't expect one. There was a real problem with education and preparedness in this case. So many of the people in that area weren't aware of tsunamis and didn't know to use the natural warning signs as a signal that they should evacuate. A catastrophic tsunami wasn't expected in the region, even though there were warning signs. There was evidence from geological studies of corals along the Sumatra coast, as well as historical accounts of large tsunamis. After investigating this, we did think that, that there was reason to have a warning system in the Indian Ocean, precisely because you could get these major events occurring there. Early attempts were made to establish a warning system, but it was not felt as a priority. It was going to take a while to get governments to pay attention to this when they had so much else to worry about in the Indian Ocean. As the waters started to recede along coastal Thailand, the true scale of the devastation became clear. Nearly 8,500 people were injured in that country alone, many requiring severe medical attention. I've gone by ambulance six hours the whole night, and now wait 10 hours and then 10 hours flight. I think then I will be really ill. But among the havoc wreaked by the tsunami, there were those beyond the reach of emergency services. When an earthquake happens, it can be devastating, but you know, usually it's, it's not such a huge area, and you have some idea of where the casualties are and where you need to rescue people. Whereas with the tsunami, they have these huge debris fields, and you have no idea where people might be either dead or alive. Search and rescue crews combed debris, alongside volunteers and families searching for their loved ones. <laughs> Family members posted flyers with pictures and descriptions of those missing. At this point, we're hoping against hope that they're still alive somewhere, hoping that they're not unconscious and can't speak or, or something like that. But within days, the chances of finding people alive faded dramatically. 
decapped for five days. I think they they died. Bodies continued to wash up on beaches three days after the tsunami. Rescue teams turned into retrieval crews. Bodies can be swept quite long distances. Bodies can be trapped in trees, in branches, in brush, and indeed can be located in places where you would not expect to find a body. So you will often get a situation where bodies are recovered perhaps weeks or months later in unusual places that were not subject to a detailed search at the time. The dead were wrapped in tarps as workers sprayed chemicals to prevent the spread of disease. As the death toll climbed, the international impact of the disaster became clear. Countries, let's say like Sweden, they had more people die from that event than any natural disaster they've had in their own country. In Thailand, multinational forensic teams started the arduous process of identifying the deceased. Uh, at this time, we have Australian team, German team, and French team. They can help us to under, uh, identify all the foreigners. It was a collection of 5,000 bodies in one place, all drowned, all black, all swollen, all looked the same. And you couldn't tell whether someone was from Africa, or from Indonesia, or from Thailand, or from Sweden. They all looked the same. Most of the people who die in this die from drowning, but also it's blunt force trauma. They get smashed. You get picked up by this thing, they get smashed into brick walls. A brick wall smashes into them because it's picked up by the tsunami. Initially, we were told we just need to separate the locals from the foreigners. The only time you could do that is if a particular local person had on a hotel uniform, for example, with a with a name tag or something that they belonged to a particular resort. So that was given up, and it was decided that all 5,000 bodies will be treated exactly the same. So every single person would have a forensic pathology examination, a forensic dental examination, a fingerprint examination. So the process started of one body at a time doing those examination procedures. I couldn't even tell you how many dentists were on the ground at any one time, but it would have been 50 or 60 working out of a converted Buddhist temple. With temperatures reaching 39 degrees Celsius, the waterlogged bodies were quickly decomposing. And we had to convert this Buddhist temple into a makeshift mortuary with plywood walls and air conditioners. Since the 2004 tsunami, authorities contacted over 4,000 relatives to come and receive bodies. However, not all could be identified. There's probably four to 500 still unidentified bodies in shipping containers buried in the ground just north of Phuket to this day. In Thailand, the tsunami killed around 5,400 people. But while the international media focused on tourists who perished in resorts, many locals were left to salvage the broken pieces of their lives. <laughs> It sometimes takes great tragedy to forge a new path ahead. I think the tsunami really was a catalyst for change in the way that the international community responds to 
large-scale disasters like this one. The United Nations mobilized and secured agreement to establish an Indian Ocean tsunami warning system. When this earthquake occurred, it was clear that we needed to be able to respond quickly and accurately to large earthquakes. When you have an earthquake of five and a half and larger, it's observed by instruments all around the world. The initial alerts for earthquakes can come out in five minutes, but it's important to get that information out as quickly as possible for tsunami warning to give people a heads up of what happened. This boy can save a lot of lives for the people living in the Indian Ocean. The new system, which became active in 2006, can provide those around the Indian Ocean with the kind of warning that may have saved lives in 2004. In the advent of an abnormal wave, sensors on the ocean floor register a change in ocean pressure. This information is transmitted to buoys on the surface then a satellite which passes the data onto a monitoring center for distribution. As well as sending warnings out to the public, officials, and the media, the centers will record data that can influence evacuation plans and save lives. The warning centers can then start to look at some of the models that they've run before. And they have taken those models to all the different coastlines that will be affected and show how bad that wave will be inundating that coastline. So immediately you've got a lot more information about where to evacuate. In terms of tsunami safety and education, no other country is more prepared than Japan. Nestled toward the top of the Pacific Ring of Fire, Japan is a volatile hub of seismic activity. Minor tremors are almost a daily occurrence across the islands, with around 1,500 earthquakes striking every year. 2,500 dead and missing is the toll of the earthquake and tidal wave that swept over a 200-mile stretch of shore along the northeast coast of Japan. Residents are trained to respond to tsunamis and the earthquakes that caused them. The country even has an early warning system. Earthquakes emit two types of waves primary waves, which cause weak tremors, and secondary waves, which cause the bulk of earthquake destruction. The faster moving primary waves can travel up to eight kilometers per second. Seismographs on the surface register this motion, triggering alerts which are sent to homes, offices, and schools, providing precautionary instructions for the oncoming secondary wave. A warning such as this was transmitted across Japan in early 2011. On the 11th of March, an undersea megathrust earthquake measuring a magnitude of 9.0 struck 130 kilometers east of Sendai. It was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan. 373 kilometers from the epicenter, citizens of Tokyo received a minute's warning before skyscrapers began to sway. The earthquake was so intense, it shortened the length of the 24-hour day by 1.8 microseconds. <laughs> The main rupture occurred over an area of only about 400 kilometers, and it had a huge amount of slip relative to previous earthquakes. In the 2004 Sumatra earthquake, 
the maximum amount of relative displacement was around 20 meters. The Japan earthquake caused 70 meters or more slip over that relatively small area. And because that slip happened right at the shallow part of the earthquake fault, it was very effective in generating a large tsunami. A Japanese Coast Guard patrol ship was one of the first to encounter the tsunami a few kilometers offshore. The wave continued toward the northeastern coast of Japan, where people were bracing for the impact. Japan is the most tsunami prepared country in the world. Was it prepared for the 2011? No. They had done modeling and they had inundation maps and they had evacuation centers. They had evacuation routes where you should go. Fundamental mistake they made was they didn't think there could be an event that big. The initial warnings that went out talked about a wave smaller than the wave that was actually coming. Part of the problem was people not understanding what those wave heights were going to be, how far they had to go to be safe, and how quickly they had to do it. And in many cases, they had very little time. Many of the tsunami shields offered little protection. There are some places along the Tohoku coast where massive tsunami barriers have been constructed and those were designed to prevent a tsunami of the maximum that was expected. In some cases, the barriers failed completely. And so those seawalls essentially became uh, material for the tsunami to move around. They then became battery rams. In Miyako City, tsunami waves reached run-up heights of 39 meters, as narrow bays focused the onslaught of water. When a tsunami enters human population areas, the first thing it's going to do is essentially go along what is the path of least resistance, so it'll go up the rivers and it'll go down the streets. Across coastal centers, people clambered atop buildings, hoping their structures could withstand the oncoming torrents. When it comes across a building or something like that, It'll build up on that, just like when you see with a, a river in flood, it's flowing down, it's piling up and piling up and piling up. And if it has enough energy, that building falls over and it's gone. In the case of a tsunami, it is an incessant, continuing surge of water coming in, and it's picked up an awful lot of stuff to bring with it. Desperate survivors in Kameishi watched as cars and fishing boats assaulted their places of refuge. Barely an hour after the initial quake, waves were surging over the Sendai Plains, two kilometers inland. Cars racing from the onslaught could barely move faster than the oncoming debris. In some places, the tsunami bore inland more than five kilometers, leaving a trail of utter devastation. Starts off with total destruction, and as that starts to decrease, it starts to leave behind the stuff that it picked up as it started to move inland. Across the world's most tsunami-prepared country, an area of approximately 560 square kilometers was inundated. It's his house, here. Even people in some evacuation centers died, and they'd done the right thing. Among the areas affected, at least 101 designated tsunami evacuation sites were hit. 
この度の東北地方太平洋沖地震はマグニチュード 9.0 という例を見ない規模の巨大地震であり被災地の被災な状況に深く心を痛めています。The Tohoku earthquake shifted Japan's main island of Honshu 2.4 meters east. As the confirmed death toll began to climb, those unaffected prayed that lost ones would return. <laughs> Forty-five thousand seven hundred buildings were destroyed, and one hundred and forty-four thousand were damaged. Towns were transformed into unrecognizable rubble. <laughs> Sendai was in the direct firing line. Of both the earthquake and the tsunami. Days after the waves, industrial complexes still burned, fueled by ruptured oil storage tanks and liquefied natural gas stockpiled at the port. Over four million homes across Japan were left without electricity. <laughs> <laughs> in heavily affected areas, survivors searched in vain for missing relatives. International emergency crews combed through wreckage. Marking empty structures with an X if they failed to find bodies inside.、And、the idea is to slowly progress through the, all the buildings and vehicles to make sure there's no persons missing in them. The earthquake and tsunami claimed over 15,800 lives. More than 2,500 on top of that were recorded missing. Amongst the severe pain and loss, there were a few stories of hope, as lucky families were reunited. Scars left by the tsunami would take years to heal. However, the waves brought further destruction on the 11th of March. Some of the area's worst hit were about to bear the brunt of what was fast becoming a rolling disaster. Tsunami より も一番怖いのは原子力なんですよね On the day of the tsunami, just 66 kilometers from Sendai. Several thousand people were being ordered to evacuate. Multiple reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant were going into meltdown. There was a lack of understanding on the part of Tokyo Power and its regulators about the vulnerabilities associated with the plant. The TEPCO plant had survived the earthquake, and the tsunami warning system had shut down the reactors, switching power for the cooling mechanisms to the backup diesel generators. 
but the generators were rendered inoperable as the waves swept over the 5.6 meter tsunami barrier. Fukushima had a seawall. It just wasn't big enough. Simple as that. And again, this comes back to the fact that they were prepared for an event that was smaller. In the case of the Fukushima reactor, the tsunami knocked out the auxiliary power supply. And so the reactor was not able to shut down and ended up, you know, going into meltdown. A total of three reactors at the plant started overheating, pressurized hydrogen gas building up in two of the containment buildings caused a series of explosions. Radioactive material was now leaking from the plant. Workers toiled to cool the reactors with water cannons and seawater dropped from helicopters. At the end of March, the evacuation zone expanded to 30 kilometers around the plant. Fractures in the plant's trenches and tunnels caused radiation to leak into the ocean. Close to the plant, levels of radioactive iodine-131 were measured at 7.5 million times the legal limit. The appearance of increased levels of radiation in some local food and water supplies prompted Japanese and international officials to issue consumption warnings. Lines stretched for blocks as parts of the country experienced food and water shortages for the first time since the Second World War. Farmers across Japan struggled as demand for their produce dropped, even in areas unaffected by the crisis. Across the exclusion zone, crops and livestock were abandoned and left to die. In Sendai, the fishing industry collapsed, leaving many communities, already devastated by the waves, to grapple with radioactive emissions. On the seventh anniversary of the disaster, TEBCO revealed that it had reduced the rate of contaminated water reaching the reactors from 400 tons per day to 100. One million tons of radioactive water still sits at the site, waiting for authorities to determine how to dispose of it. The Fukushima incident was the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl in 1986. A parliament-appointed investigation committee concluded that the disaster was man-made, the result of collusion between the government, regulators, and the operator of the plant, Tokyo Electric Power Company. There was a reluctance on the part of the utility to address tsunami safety, in part because this seemed to be such a low probability event that its likelihood was discounted. 
もちろんその作業というのは10年をはるかに超えて30年そんなことまで言われるような長い作業になってまいります Today, areas closest to the plant stand frozen in time as people fear to return to some sectors that the government has deemed safe. Japan will continue to carry the horror of the Tohoku tsunami for decades to come, but it has the wealth and facilities to slowly heal. For those in less economically stable areas, recovery is not always so certain. The 2004 tsunami ravished some communities around the Indian Ocean so badly that many would never be the same. Apart from the loss of life, the environmental and economic impact was enormous requiring global assistance to rebuild. Rallying together, the international community donated $14 billion in aid across affected countries. In the five years following the tsunami, the International Federation of Red Cross Societies alone provided nearly 5 million people with assistance, rebuilding 51,000 new houses and restoring nearly 300 hospitals and clinics. One of the issues also in the Indian tsunami was the state of the coastal mangroves and other ecosystems that were degraded. And so there was an effort to restore and to plant more mangrove forests around the coasts. I Revitalized mangroves create a buffer between communities and any coastal hazards. There's now a big drive from many organizations to promote nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches because it creates a lot of benefits, not only in terms of risk reduction, but also in terms of livelihoods and sustainability. We like to empowering the people to look after their environment by themselves. To effectively grow back communities, experts require a comprehensive picture of the destructive potential of seismically triggered waves. The first accounts of a tsunami date over 4,000 years ago. But in the last two decades, we've experienced two events unprecedented in scale. We can't predict exactly how big and where an earthquake will be, but we can predict regions that are potentially closer to having a very large earthquake. Earthquake-prone coastal areas need to look to recent tragedies and prepare for the inevitability of the next tsunami. While the Indian Ocean and Tohoku tsunamis left trails of disaster, they also provided data that could one day save lives. We could trace the entire inundation of this tsunami all the way through five kilometers inland. We can now say to you, okay, once every X number of years, you're going to get a wave this big coming through. We can only hope that we are better prepared when disaster strikes from the sea once more. giant howling vortex of thunder and rain, spreading its spiral arms in a destructive embrace. 
that can reach more than a thousand kilometers. I feel like we've lost our city. This is a tropical cyclone. It's just this massive roar and it hits like a freight train. The winds can be deadly, but the storm surge even worse. I got nothing left. My initial impression was just one of complete and utter devastation. It makes it a huge humanitarian problem and a huge technical problem. Just how do you clean up this? As storms intensify and urban populations explode, we're more at risk than ever before. Hurricanes are getting more intense and longer lasting. The casualties more or less 10,000. Sifting through the wreckage of some of the world's biggest disasters, we can find the clues to predicting and surviving one of the most extraordinary forces of nature. Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind, as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? The southeastern states of the US are famous for their laid-back lifestyle, cradling the warm blue waters of the Gulf of Mexico. But the tropics attract more than just beachgoers and tourists. They're the breeding ground of some of the world's most ferocious cyclones. We're just trying to get as far away from here as possible. So in different parts of the world, they call it different things. In Australia, it's called a cyclone. In uh, USA, it's called a hurricane. In Mexico, it's called a huracan. In East Asia, it's called a typhoon, but it's all the same thing. Hurricane Katrina was born as a tropical depression. On August 23rd, 2005, just near the Bahamas. When these cyclones form in tropical areas, they get what's known as a warm core. So the air rises up around it and then starts to sink, hence forming the eye of a cyclone. High rates of evaporation drive the movement of warm, moist air up into the atmosphere. So the oceans need to be around about 27 degrees Celsius and you need upper atmospheric conditions to be favourable to allow that air to rise and then diverge or spread out. A lot of it has to do with low wind shear, meaning that there's no strong winds at different levels of the atmosphere. There are no major damages so far, mainly tree debris and power lines that were blown down. Warm waters are the fuel source of tropical cyclones. As the air at the ocean surface moves upwards, pressure drops and more moist, warm air is sucked in to replace it, creating a vortex of intense winds. As cyclones travel over tropical waters, they can rapidly intensify and grow. It was after Katrina traversed South Florida and came out over the Gulf of Mexico where there were some very uh, high sea surface temperatures that it began to really develop. You have an obligation to yourself and your family to haul ass and get out of here. And I'm telling you, get out now. In the Gulf, Katrina morphed into a monster with winds surpassing 175 kilometers an hour. It's better to be safe than sorry, and I'd rather prepare early than be without when the time comes. 
Hurricane Katrina was a massive storm. At one point, it was a Category 5, and it filled the entire Gulf of Mexico. Katrina then went through a distinctive transformation before it reached the coast. So you have these spiral armbands that, that uh, sort of wrap around the storm. And if the spiral armband gets wrapped around so much, it can actually shut off the eye wall. And then the old eye wall dies, and a new eye wall forms. This is one of the processes that makes the storm bigger. Katrina weakened to a Category 3, but grew in size. And it stopped intensifying, and then it just started to spread out. And the wind field became very large at that point. Nestled on the banks of Lake Pontchartrain, Louisiana's biggest city, New Orleans, was directly in the eye's path. If you look out and you see the level of the lake and look at the houses, the lake is above the houses. A mandatory evacuation order was executed, the first in the history of the city. Residents were given plenty of warning. A big one was coming. But nothing prepared them for what was in store. The estimates are that somewhere between 100 to 120,000 residents of the city of New Orleans either could not evacuate or chose not to evacuate in advance of Katrina's landfall. Katrina was sort of two disasters at once. So there was a sort of traditional hurricane disaster that happened on the Mississippi coast. Mississippi was to the right of the center. The winds were blowing onshore and they had an unbelievable storm surge that inundated all those coastal towns. New Orleans was on the western side of the center and there, wind was blowing from Lake Pontchartrain into the city. When the storm surge flooded into Lake Pontchartrain, the levees couldn't take the strain. So when they gave way, there was really nothing to stop the water from just pouring in. My understanding is most of the people drowned one way or another. It was the water inundation that killed people. Storm surge is one of the most deadly effects of tropical cyclones. Although Hurricane Katrina weakened to a Category 3 before landfall, its enormous size displaced huge volumes of water. We saw tidal surges, water, cover things that just amazed me. One of the things that really blew my mind about Katrina was how much of the U.S. coast had impacts. Basically from Louisiana almost to the Florida Panhandle had sustained hurricane force winds. This was a four-story condo complex with parking underneath. <sighs> Send a lot of help. Storm surge prone area like the Northern Gulf, you start piling up a lot of water along the coast and uh, carrying a lot of water with the center of the storm. In the end, it affected an area of land of about 90,000 square miles, which is about the size of Great Britain. Six, five, Tropical cyclones are most easily studied from space. And NASA has an arsenal of sophisticated instruments to help track and predict their formation and path. The Terra and Aqua satellites analyze rainfall rates, temperature and humidity, as well as surface wind speed, cloud height, and ocean heat. Closer to the ground, 
Hurricane hunters carry out riskier missions. So the mission purpose today is to stay in the environment as long as humanly possible. Storm penetration is done by Air Force C-130, as well as the P-3 aircraft from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And the flight tracks are designed to find the center, and you're not gonna find the center unless you actually go to the center, and that means penetrating the eye wall. While the eye wall of the storm contains the strongest winds of the cyclone, the center, the eye itself, is an oasis of calm. The eye of a hurricane is one of the most surreal experiences. To get into the eye, you've got to get through the worst part of the storm. So you're shell-shocked from this constant roaring of wind. And all of a sudden it's calm. You can dash outside quickly if you want to, but then you can hear the return eye wall coming. Hard to believe this is a street, isn't it? And it hits like a freight train. Cyclones are rated according to their wind speeds. In the Western Hemisphere, they use a classification called the Saffir-Simpson scale. Between 120 and 150 kilometers per hour, hurricanes are a category one. At category three, the level of Hurricane Katrina, major damage is expected. Trees will be uprooted and large-scale destruction of infrastructure may occur. The highest rating is Category 5. It's applied to any hurricane over 251 kilometers an hour. Little can withstand this type of hurricane. The number of the Saffir Simpson scale is related to wind only, and it really doesn't convey the entire threat. There are many other threats associated with it that sometimes are proportional to that scale and sometimes not. Cyclones don't need to be large to create massive, deadly storm surges. Take Super Typhoon Haiyan, the fiercest tropical cyclone to ever make landfall. In 2013, it hit Tacloban City in the Philippines at a Category 5 rating. The most severe wind category possible. More than 6,000 people were killed. Please contact this number so that we can also get him. The media and people have a way of confusing the intensity of a storm with the size. So they say that super typhoon Haiyan was really large. Actually, it was the opposite. It was a very small typhoon, but it was very intense. That Philippine Sea area, if there's a bathtub of hot water on the planet, that, that is the place. The sea surface temperature where Haiyan formed was around 30 degrees Celsius. With a lack of wind shear, there was nothing to slow it down. Winds were measured at a sustained speed of 305 kilometers per hour. But momentary gusts reached 380. But it was hard for anything to actually report a wind in that kind of environment. Almost no measurement device will withstand that. So it's kind of hard to tell. Haiyan smashed into the Philippines at near peak intensity, with 25 million people in its path. So I picked a hotel right in the center of the city, a big concrete hotel, and that's where I decided to hunker down for this typhoon. The wind's starting to make that moaning sound. I think maybe we're just starting to get in the cyclone circulation. It was utter devastation. Uh, Tacloban almost was wiped off the map. It starts out, it's just windy, rainy, messy weather, and then it gets worse and worse. And finally, when you get into the inner core of the hurricane, or what we call the eye wall, that's when things go nuts. 
The building is getting torn apart. The eye wall is the area of strongest winds, right at the center of the cyclone, where moisture-filled air is rushing upwards at phenomenal speeds. The rain is so heavy and the wind is so violent that everything just turns white. It's a whiteout. Debris flying everywhere. I mean, stuff smashing into buildings. The kind of stuff that if it hit you, it would kill you instantly. Tacloban City is on the tip of a peninsula at the top of a very narrow bay. And what happened was the center passed south of the city, then the winds shifted to the southeast. It basically had all this wind forcing all of this water into this narrow bay. And then all of a sudden it just overflowed into the city and it swept the entire downtown area. It was literally like a tsunami. And it happened so fast that thousands couldn't get out of the way in time. We have an estimate given on the casualties, more or less 10,000. Nothing was ever like Haiyan, and I have not seen anything like it since. To see a city of 220,000 people just destroyed, whole city blocks just gone, piles of rubble, bodies in the streets. Of course, you expect to see emergency services, first responders out, you know, helping people who were injured or rendering aid. Uh, that was not the case here. Sa mga news, sabi daw, meron ng mga relief. But sadly, walang dumadating sa amin. Magnitude of this catastrophe was so huge that that society was paralyzed. There are no sirens, there's no traffic through the streets. Well, there can't be because the, the streets are blocked with wreckage. There's just desperate residents trying to dig through the rubble. It is one of the saddest, most awful things I've ever seen. A complete breakdown of infrastructure, of, of just basic city services, hospitals overflowing with injured people. I never saw something so grim or desperate. Haiyan was just, it's, it's burned in my memory. Almost one million people in the Philippines were made homeless by the disaster. As shortages of food, water, and medicines drove the population to despair. Thousands stormed the local airport on November 12th. They broke down fences, struggling to board planes. Aid trucks were attacked and their food stolen. It's chaotic, I don't know where to go. We don't know where to go to get any food. Troops were sent in and a curfew put in place to try to restore order. A week after the cyclone hit, Takloban began the terrible task of burying their dead. Bodies lined the foreshores of the wrecked city to be photographed, labeled, and buried in a mass grave. This happens a lot of places in the world where there are lots of poor uh, regions the structures are not well well constructed and they don't last at all and the people if they are able to get out they have nowhere to go in a situation like this nothing is fast enough the need is massive the need is immediate because everybody all at the same time uh, is hungry all at the same time have no water all at the same time have no communication no power and so it makes it a huge humanitarian problem a huge technical problem, just how do you clean up this? What do you rebuild? There are pictures of weeks and months later in, in Taklaban of complete devastation still there. It was very hard to gather the resources to begin the cleanup and the rebuilding process. The resources were just not there.
The day after Hurricane Katrina passed, residents across the Gulf states emerged to assess the damage. Although spared a direct hit, the worst was yet to come for New Orleans. The water just come up, I mean, just out of nowhere. And everybody here was trying to head for higher ground, and there is no higher ground. Some of those people who didn't evacuate because they didn't think the hurricane was going to be as bad as it was, they weren't necessarily wrong because much of the flooding and destruction that happened in New Orleans was because of the levee system that failed. Until the levees were repaired and Lake Pontchartrain tamed, the city would remain submerged. The sand layer was three quarters of the way up to the ceiling, which showed us that it was a phenomenal force of water going through those houses. The debris doubled in its size, so it's only a matter of time for the levee to completely disintegrate in front of us. The levees were designed and built by the US Army Corps of Engineers to protect the city from flooding. But even they knew its limitations. The US Army Corps of Engineers had done experiments on these levees in the 1980s and knew that the type of levees that they had built would burst once the water got up to a certain level. Within 24 hours, there were more than 28 reported breaches of the flood barriers. Not all of them collapsed. Some of them didn't meet up with other parts of the, the canal walls because one part was owned by one government department, another part was owned by another government department, and they didn't see eye to eye for various bureaucratic reasons, and so they never joined them. So then in some parts, 80% of the city was flooded, and in some parishes, uh, over 80% of the homes were lost. Hundreds of people drowned. I've seen a lot of dead bodies, and I saved a few people, you know, out the houses, and I could have, which I could have drowned myself, you know. Tens of thousands were stranded. Despite the evacuation orders, up to 120,000 residents remained in the city. Many people didn't leave because they could not leave. They were either elderly or disabled. They didn't have cash in the bank or they didn't have credit cards. And in some instances, no family or friends outside of the city. They are getting sick out there. The water's getting pretty stagnant. There was also concerns in a lot of people that they wanted them to evacuate because they wanted their land. New Orleans was a booming city, and there were developers who wanted some of their homes and that they would be not allowed back. I could be safe in here. Yeah. I can watch my house. I don't want to leave. If locals' faith in the system was frayed before Katrina, the failure of authorities in its aftermath tore it apart. This is a devastating storm. This is a storm that's going to require immediate action now. I'm pleased to report the troops that have been called in that the convention center is secure. By September 1st, 30,000 people had crammed into the damaged Louisiana Superdome. Another 25,000 in the convention center both designated temporary shelters. Despite their official status, they had nowhere near the resources to cope with this scale of disaster. Conditions were diabolical. There are six bodies upstairs on the third floor, and then there's this guy right here that's dead. And they've been making promises to us that they were gonna move us, move us, and move us, and people just really been getting frustrated at this point. The media reported widespread looting, and the authorities appeared more interested in incarceration than belief. We ain't got nothing. You know? We got to steal from each other so we can survive and feed our children. 
There were reports of isolated cases of violence among the abandoned population in the evacuation centers. As the evacuees were becoming increasingly desperate. There were massive food and water shortages in the Superdome as well as in the convention center. And so you can imagine when there are tens of thousands of people in these conditions, how quickly you might think things would descend into chaos. And that was what the media really reported. Instead, it appears that people really began to self-organize to figure out how they could get the resources there that were necessary, especially for the most vulnerable people. I thank God that everybody is sticking as neighbors and helping one another. If we didn't have one another in this city, we would be lost. Thank you. Eventually, thousands of people sheltered in New Orleans were evacuated out of the city. Keep your family members together! Thousands of federal troops were sent in with ships. I'm a National Guard. Do you need help? And hundreds of helicopters. But it wasn't enough. A plea was broadcast across local TV and radio for private boat owners to come to the rescue. They became known as the Cajun Navy. Hurricanes, I really believe, bring out the best in people. Humans have a desire to stick together when the chips are down, and I think that a hurricane or an earthquake or something like that brings it out. So we've studied this. There's actually a, a whole feeling of, of community cohesion, a kind of euphoric feeling that we can do this together. Knowing your neighbor, being connected to your neighbors, and really helping one another to prepare for these extreme events may be one of the most important things that individuals can do in terms of increasing their own probability of survival in a disaster. The Atlantic provides conditions for some tremendously large hurricanes. The Atlantic Basin often gets very, very wide diameter systems. They're really dangerous because the strong winds extend out for such a long distance. Hurricane tracks from the last 150 years look like mad scribbles drawn inexorably to the same location. Why does the southeast coast of the US act like such a magnet? As with all weather patterns on Earth, if you follow them back to their ultimate source, you end up at the sun. As it beats down on the Sahara, the enormous desert that spans North Africa, heat radiates back off the landscape. As heated air rises several kilometers into the atmosphere, it turns and moves toward the Gulf of Guinea. This movement of air becomes the African easterly jet, a band of wind that moves across the Atlantic, heading straight to America. This jet gets kinks in it, carrying low-pressure systems known as tropical waves. Tropical waves take on many forms, but they're sort of organizations of thunderstorms that travel across the tropics. And this is how Katrina began. The tracks of most Atlantic hurricanes usually head back out to sea. But it was very scary, very scary. Oh my God. But the path of superstorm Sandy 
one of the most destructive and surprising hurricanes to hit the east coast of America, left many forecasters scratching their heads. Sandy formed late in the 2012 hurricane season, beginning fairly predictably in the Caribbean. Las condiciones que tenemos aquí en la vivienda, ustedes pueden apreciar. No sé si podrá soportar el impacto del ciclón. Sandy did form from tropical wave. It became a, a major hurricane as it crossed over Cuba and moved toward the Bahamas. As a category three, Sandy tore across Cuba. Waves up to nine meters smashed the Cuban coast, along with a two-meter storm surge. More than 100,000 homes were damaged. And 11 people killed. And Sandy just kept going. You know, after it had intensified and gone through Cuba, we expected it to go out to sea. Due to a phenomenon known as the Coriolis effect, cyclones will spin in different directions depending on their location in relation to the equator. If the cyclone occurs in the northern hemisphere, they spin anti-clockwise, while the opposite occurs in the southern. This has a dramatic effect on a cyclone's path. So in the southern hemisphere, they tend to curve out towards the southeast. In the northern hemisphere, they tend to curve out towards the northeast. And so in the case of the east coast of the US, it would be moving away from the coast. But for some reason, Sandy bucked this trend. It really got strange, but it made the left turn, which is very unusual for, for a hurricane in the Atlantic. Sandy kept growing in size. It started developing cold fronts and, and warm fronts. So it became a structure that was quite unfamiliar to most hurricane forecasters. It then went through what we call extra tropical transition. So in other words, it's moving into cooler waters. So it technically wasn't a hurricane anymore because it was a beast, basically. As it passed over cooler waters, Sandy lost intensity but grew in size, becoming the largest Atlantic hurricane in recorded history. At its widest, Sandy had a diameter of 1,400 kilometers. The beast's left curve into the most densely populated area of the US was the result of Sandy's collision with another weather system. It turns out that there was a particularly strong system to the west of Sandy. Cold air actually coming quite far south over the central and eastern United States that played a role in Sandy's turn to the left. The merging systems brought snow and ice to the mountains of West Virginia, with blizzards slamming into the region in a howling gale. Crazy. You can't go nowhere. Trees in the road, the interstate shut down. Not much you can do. Feet of snow in, in parts of the uh, Appalachians. Just amazing. So you had these, uh, this juxtaposition of tropical hazards and wintertime hazards in such an event. As the Appalachians froze, the northeast coast was smashed by huge storm surges exacerbated by the full moon and high tide, two days before Halloween. It hit us really, really bad. So places around New York City and along the New Jersey coast were completely inundated. Big disruption, a lot of problems in a heavily populated area. There was more than a 10-foot storm surge at the Battery. It was higher than any structure they had to prevent it, and so once the water got over that, it hadn't nothing to keep it from going into the subway and, and other things. 
And so there were widespread power outages throughout lower Manhattan as well as uh, in surrounding regions that millions of people had their power knocked out. We also saw schools that were badly flooded. In Superstorm Sandy, people had to be evacuated because of flooding that was occurring there. Hurricane Katrina had taught the U.S. health system many lessons about preparedness. So even though damage and flooding were widespread, health services did not collapse. Probably one of the biggest lessons we had from Hurricane Katrina was how the health system was not prepared. We realized that the healthcare system needed to take responsibility for itself and have its own emergency management approach. As a result, in Hurricane Sandy, the New York City area hospitals really did quite well in many regards. Though there were closures, they had been practicing and they had been preparing during that decade in between, and hospitals were up and running very quickly. Finding boats in the middle of the road is not what anybody would hope for today. The full moon and high tide enhanced the storm surge, along with climate change. Though we knew with high tide it was going to be really bad, we just never thought it would be this bad. Sea levels surrounding New York are around a foot higher than they were in 1950. This makes any storm surge more severe than it would have been a century ago. The total cost was somewhere around $75 billion, and probably half of that uh, is associated with the flooding of the subway system. And so the damage was tremendous. Climate change is also warming the seas, which fuel hurricanes. The best way to think of it, in my view, is that the storms mostly occur much as they did before. But it's in a warmer, moister environment, as a result, it can actually reach out and grab more moisture and bring it into that storm. It can invigorate the storm in that process. The strongest effects are in the tropics. So this relates to hurricanes in particular. This had a dramatic effect on the deadliest Atlantic hurricane in the last 200 years with a death toll over 11,000. It was the rainfall that turned Hurricane Mitch into an unrivaled human disaster. Bueno, yo estoy para volverme loca, sinceramente no. Mi vida es andar para arriba y para abajo porque mientras no encuentre el resto de mi hijo para enterrarlo tan siquiera. Hurricane Mitch began in the Caribbean in late October 1998 and rapidly intensified, reaching Category 5 status in just two days. As it approached Honduras, winds had weakened considerably, but the storm became extremely slow moving, producing a tremendous amount of rain in one region. The hilly terrain was subject to all this incredible moisture uh, moving in from the Atlantic and riding up on the hillside, creating devastating flash flooding. This happens in other parts of the world too, where you have such a tremendous amount of moisture coming inland, encountering mountains or hilly terrain where there's just so much water coming down at once that mudslides occur and these can take out entire towns. In Honduras, entire villages were washed away by mudslides. It's all rain-induced, and you, you can, it's easy to get 10 to 20 inches of rain on hillsides in a relatively short period. The soil underneath just can't withstand that, and eventually it just gives way and becomes liquid, and it all slides down the hill. 
That's what killed most of the people. Hemos dedicado lo que es la búsqueda y recuperación de cadáveres. Entonces nuestra labor ahorita es ver lo que podemos recuperar de los cadáveres y The storm's effects reached Nicaragua. One gigantic mudslide in Pasoltega killed 2,000 people. Rescue workers who tried to reach devastated villages were severely hampered by rising floodwaters. In Honduras, most of the land used for agriculture is on hillsides. With many years of slash and burn agriculture, farmers cut and torched forests to plant crops, clearing new areas again when soils became less fertile. In cases where there has been a fire or deliberate logging and deforestation, you disturb the soil's ability to deal with the amount of water that's coming down directly as precipitation or runoff. Once we start chopping down trees, in any environmental situation, we're going to cause damage, but also the stability of the land surface as well. Mudslides demolished many of the country's crops. Bananas, beans, and sugarcane were hard hit with losses totaling $480 million. Roads were cut off and bridges destroyed, leaving those desperately in need of assistance isolated. Much of the infrastructure was devastated. In both countries, a total of two million people were left homeless. The months that followed became a life and death struggle for some of Latin America's poorest people, who had only recently started to recover from years of civil war. The impact was so devastating that the World Meteorological Organization permanently retired the name Mitch from its hurricane list. In the years preceding Mitch, tropical cyclones have become more severe, and the retiring of names has become more common. The 2005 hurricane season was so severe, it saw a record number of names retired. Dennis, Rita, Stan, Wilma, and Katrina. But for many New Orleans natives, the scars Katrina left will never fade. You have the original trauma of the hurricane, which is extremely upsetting. You're seeing your house flooding. You might be seeing dead bodies floating by. This will go on for hours, if not a day or more, before you get help. Very traumatic experience. As families are moved into temporary shelters in the aftermath, the stress is ongoing. As a sociologist, I was particularly interested in studying how children were affected by the storm and its aftermath. Almost all of the children missed days, if not weeks, if not months of school. There were also impacts in terms of the shattering of friend and family networks. We also saw many longer term effects for children in terms of who graduated. It had a lot to do with how many times they moved after this storm. It's often said that natural disasters are the great equalizer but the opposite is closer to the truth. 
One of many insights that has come out of this work is that disasters don't dissolve pre-existing inequalities. What disasters do is they exacerbate social fault lines. When it comes to who has the resources, the capacity to actually prepare for, respond to, and recover from disaster, we know that that is profoundly influenced by social class, by race, and by other characteristics. Some of the populations that were displaced in Katrina included some of the most economically disenfranchised populations and also were some of the areas of the city that were slowest to get the necessary recovery resources. Almost six weeks after Katrina first made landfall, the last of the water was pumped out of New Orleans. But returning home is by no means an end to the trauma. And even after a storm passes, the water stays in a building and continues to wreak havoc. And in many cases, homes were, had to be destroyed completely. Just had these large expanses that were uninhabitable for a very long time. And even after the water drains away, you still have to deal with the cleanup. And the economic cost is enormous. The effects linger for years and even decades after such a devastating event. The first reaction was I was glad I got out myself, you know, glad I didn't stay because I sure, certainly wouldn't have made it. Many important lessons have been learned from the mistakes of Hurricane Katrina. However, there's no guarantee it won't happen again, even in the same city. And one of the unfortunate things is the Corps of Engineers has built back most of these levees to prepare for the next Category 3 storm, but they're not prepared for a Category 4 or Category 5 storm. And so this can easily happen again sometime in the future. As destructive as tropical cyclones are, viewed as purely a meteorological phenomenon, they are an awe-inspiring and extremely important part of the natural balance of our world. They are a, an amazing force of nature. Their symmetry, um, the way they move, the way they form is quite phenomenal. But they're also a mechanism which redistributes heat very effectively around the Earth. We need that to be able to perform that meteorological mechanism. Continuing our scientific fascination with tropical cyclones is essential for better predicting where and when the next big one will hit. They're extremely complicated to understand, and really understand. And to understand how they form, you need to really understand the entirety of atmospheric sciences, all the way from how water vapor behaves to complex dynamics in, in the atmosphere. And you have to put it all together. It still never ceases to amaze me that this unbelievable machine, this scary creation, is just a, a natural result of the Earth's processes. We know what we need to do in order to help populations to better prepare for disasters. Come on, boy. Right now, it's a question of do we have the political will and are we going to invest what it's actually going to take to help make communities and cities more resilient to natural hazards. Of all natural disasters, floods are the most common and the most deadly. 
when their bodies were found. Many of them didn't even have body hair or clothing left. They have the power to bury cities, decimate farmlands, and ruin economies. These extreme rainfall events are known to produce some of the highest impact uh, types of weather phenomena that we see around the world. Floods are inevitable, but their catastrophic effects depend largely on human behavior. When you have very urbanized environments, that actually can contribute more to the flood. We see these events all over the world where the weather event plus the vulnerability can truly lead to a major disaster. But my entire life for it is washed away. How we build, where we live, how we power our lives. These floods had a one in a thousand year chance of, of occurring. But with climate change, it increases the odds. And this much bigger flood wave then comes and hits a much denser population. What can we learn from the big floods of our time? And how can we best prepare for an uncertain future? Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind, as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? Pakistan is a landscape of extremes. It sits on the edge of the world's warmest ocean, the Indian Ocean, and backs up against the icy peaks of the Himalayas. It has this mountainous region that is very steep, but then after that, it's, it's relatively flat. It has this mountainous region, very fertile lands. From the glaciers to the sea runs the mighty Indus. The Indus River is one of the biggest rivers in the world. It has a massive floodplain. And this is essentially the reason why that part of the world is so fertile and so productive in terms of agriculture. The Indus Valley is one of the early cradles of civilization. Around 6,000 years ago, people here began farming the landscape and building urban centers. Now, more than 100 million people in Pakistan rely on the river for drinking water and irrigation. The Indus gets some of its waters from snow and glacial melt, but most from the enormous amount of water dumped each year by the Asian monsoon. हम खुदा का शुक्र करते हैं कि बहुत अरसे के बाद कराची में बड़े इंतजार के बाद बड़ी गर्मी के बाद बारिश हो रही है इट्स पीपल आर नो स्ट्रेंजर टू फ्लडिंग इन फैक्ट इट्स की टू देयर सर्वाइवल फ्लड इज एसेंशियली द इनंडेशन ऑफ वाटर ऑन अ लैंड दैट नॉर्मली इज नॉट कवर्ड बाय वाटर this inundation can be massive. It can be really inundated for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. It can be a minor inundation. These minor inundations are the frequent floods that civilization has depended on to sustain our ecosystems or provide nutrients or spread silt on floodplains. This is where the biggest, you know, agricultural farms in the world have existed. The Asian monsoon can vary dramatically in its intensity, as it's driven by heat. Every summer, 
the monsoon starts about uh, June and it runs through August or September every year and it brings most of the rainfall to the region. It's primarily forced by a difference in the land and sea temperature. In the summer, the land heats up much faster than the ocean. And this drives a lot of the oceanic moisture into the continent that is then focused by the Himalayas. And it creates copious amounts of rainfall throughout the country. And this is the majority of the water that falls on the continent. Every three years on average, Pakistan experiences a major flood. But 2010 was their most destructive in history. The monsoon is a life-giving, you know, source of water for a lot of South Asia. But that one was extraordinary in that there was an exceptionally long duration of heavy rain. There's also been a tendency in recent decades for the monsoon front to be a little bit further north, which is causing rain to occur in parts of the country that have more steep terrain. Heavy monsoonal rain had already been falling through most of July, with floods creating havoc in Balochistan. But in the last week, a torrential downpour began to pound the northwest province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, a mountainous part of the country that normally remains arid and dry, even in monsoon season. It was basically very weak uh, precipitation that was formed by the uplift of moist air along the topography, which is very rare actually for this part of the world. Some parts of the province reported almost four meters of rain in a week. The steep terrain concentrated the intense rain into pockets of the landscape, creating flash floods. Basically, you get more rainfall into the, some of these river valleys that then collects and then floods the lowlands. And in this Pakistan case, actually, it, it flooded Peshawar, which is a river valley uh, kind of in, in the lowlands, but the precipitation was concentrated over the complex terrain. Think of a flood as a spectrum. On the very short fused end of the spectrum, it rains, and even before the rain stops, within hours, you can have a very devastating flood moving through. That's a flash flood. In Pakistan, you had, in the initial stages with these big bursts of rain, you had flash flooding, especially in the steep areas where the water's gonna flow faster. But then eventually that reached the big rivers, which swelled up and it took days, you know, for them to reach their peak as well. So they saw the whole spectrum. Some tributaries of the Indus almost doubled their previous record flow rates. many rivers reach record levels. But even the smaller creeks, as you go up into the highlands, in some cases, they were the first to burst their banks, cause flash floods. And that ended up downstream in the bigger rivers. Locals described the rivers as demons, consuming all in their path. Although floodwaters subsided within days in the northern parts of Pakistan, more than a thousand were killed in these early flash floods. Floodwaters are, are one of the world's worst natural hazards in terms of loss of life and economic damage, and people quite often underestimate the power of water. As soon as water starts to move, it can be highly destructive. Each cubic meter weighs a ton. It can rip up boulders weighing tons, 
if it hits a building or a car or a person, then it just has an enormous force behind it. For many Venezuelans, the power of water is something they will never forget. In 1999, a devastating debris flow hit the state of Vargas, a narrow strip of coastline to the north of the country. The December 1999 floods in the north coast of Venezuela were exceptional because it was one of the deadliest recorded floods in history. In fact, I'm told in Vargas State, 10% of the population lost their lives. In that event, tens of thousands were buried alive under torrents of mud and rocks, even as they slept. It was that we have found a great number of people who are in a state of crisis. And the worst thing that there is is that there are a great number of cadavers who are in the process of decomposition. There's a dreadful irony to the Vargas tragedy. Its history of catastrophic flooding is the reason so many people settled here in the first place. If you're not familiar with the north coast of Venezuela, it's very steep mountains that come down to the Caribbean Sea. Historically, there have been many flash floods there that deposit a lot of sediment and debris, and they create these flat, fan-shaped areas called alluvial fans. Alluvial fans are typically found where a canyon drains out from the base of mountains. They form when heavy rains lift the topsoil and rocks off steep slopes and carry them towards the ocean. These fans can be enormous. Entire cities have been built on alluvial fans. Because these are flat, these are natural places for cities to build. So the population tends to be located on these alluvial fans. But these alluvial fans are still building. One of these is the Carabaeda fan. The city of Carabaeda was founded several years after the last major flood event in 1951. By 1999, the population had swelled to more than 300,000. In Vargas State, and in particular in the city of Carabaleta, we combine two things that we see so often in floods. There's the intense rain, and then there was the vulnerability. You had a major flood event, something that there's evidence has happened before, and you have now, what you didn't have centuries ago, a large population on the areas where the debris is being deposited. December is not normally rainy in Venezuela. The wet season usually wraps up around October, but a cold front had interacted with a moist southwesterly wind in the Pacific Ocean, and heavy rains began to fall in the San Julian Basin, which feeds the Carabaeda fan. There was a period of abnormally high rainfall so that the ground is wet, rivers are already running high, and then on the night of December 15th into 16th was the really intense rain. Eyewitness accounts say debris flows began around 8 p.m. on the 15th, when a phenomenal amount of water cascaded down the mountainside ripping apart the landscape and triggering thousands of shallow landslides. There's a huge amount of water moving down a very steep slope. Once water's picked up a lot of debris and it's got boulders in it, then, then all sorts of structures will be vulnerable. And all of this started coming down and finally it hit this flat patch of land. That is where all the people were living and it caused massive devastation. The amount of water that came down the steep slopes in three days was almost double the yearly average rainfall. The United States Geological Society estimates around 1.8 million cubic meters were dumped on the city. The city was destroyed. Boulders the size of trucks 
were lifted off the mountainside and hurled into apartment buildings. Bueno, esto fue algo inesperado. Pero esta vez fue algo, como se dice, como si se hubiera abierto el Cerro Ávila. Debris deposits were head high. No exact death toll was recorded because entire towns, including Cerro Grande, simply vanished. Only a thousand bodies were recovered, but it's thought up to 30,000 people may have perished, either buried or swept out to sea. Survival of those kinds of floods where you have a lot of debris in the water and it's high velocity water is very difficult. There was a study done in, in the United States in the state of Colorado where 144 people died in a flash flood in 1976, and the coroner had determined that none of them drowned. They all died from traumatic injuries. Many of them didn't even have body hair or clothing left when their bodies were found. That's the force of what happens in these steep mountain areas when you have all this debris coming down with the water. This is an example of ferocity of a flash flood. A flood that is coming down a big river, a long river like the Indus or the Ganges or any of the long rivers, uh, it's kind of predictable. With such steep mountains, the prediction time is nothing. In the aftermath, 64,000 troops were deployed to Vargas, along with massive bulldozers to clear an access path to the towns. The major highways were buried, making evacuations difficult. For those survivors who stayed, there were little supplies for months. A notoriously volatile part of the world, looting was widespread amidst reports of rapes and other violence. Vigilantes patrolled the streets with sticks and baseball bats. The cost was put at close to 3.5 billion US dollars. But despite the inherent risks of living on the Carabayeda fan, the city began to rebuild once more. Ahorita está todo destruido por todos lados y mientras que uno consigue eso será dentro de un año, dos años que arreglen esto, que uno se puede ir mientras tanto hay que seguir durmiendo aquí porque para dónde se va a ir uno, para dónde. While severe floods have occurred on these alluvial fans since prehistoric times. The Vargas death toll may have been much lower had the steep terrain above not been deforested. The rain that comes down, about 10% of that will get stuck onto the leaves of the tree. That's called interception. So basically you're having roughly 10% more rain coming down instantly onto the ground. Forests help stabilize an area. So when you remove forests, the, the soil is much more prone when it's on a steep slope to just slide away with the flood. So this whole process of the rain flowing to the river becomes much faster. Deforestation has also stripped Pakistan bare in recent decades. When it became independent in 1947, around a third of the country was covered in forest. Now, that figure is less than 2%. Some of the tree loss is due to poverty, with trees providing fuel and other resources. But most is attributed to the Timber Mafia, an illegal and ruthless logging organization which has operated under the protection of the Taliban. In the flash floods, logs from felled trees cause devastation of their own. Swept out of the valleys into raging rivers, 
They helped smash down every bridge in their path. एक पुल भी नहीं बचा मालाकंड से लेके कलाम तक तो पहली हमारी कोशिश ये है कि लोग जो है कम से कम पैदल पार कर सके तो ये More than 250 bridges collapsed in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa alone. So you have damages and transportation routes not at just one bridge but across the entire segment of the river. Flash floods took out power stations, telecommunication towers, homes, crops and other infrastructure, creating a rolling disaster. The rolling disaster is essentially a disaster happening that is triggering off another disaster that is triggering off another disaster. Ite mar raste de la dan pera. Na dar kar na dai bas Allah sanai kari garib ban saba. Wo ra jaao ba. Allah sanai kari garib ban saba bas sanai kari. We have a major flood event. The services that sustain society, they are the first things to get disrupted. Transportation routes are impacted. people are unable often to communicate all the storm water services all the sanitation services are not working so it's it's like one problem after another by early august flood waters had begun to subside in the north and create devastation in the south punjab and sindh were inundated as the indus broke its banks in many places the rains simply wouldn't stop deforestation helped silt up many waterways and dams reducing their flow capacity ironically so did levees canals and other structures built to tame the river the entire indus valley area is probably one of the most efficient um irrigation networks in the world but when you create canals you don't really allow for the frequent floods to occur these minor floods should take the silt from the river and wash it out onto the flood plains but as more canals and irrigation systems crisscross the landscape less silt is escaping the river system So the amount of space you have between the bottom of the canal or the river and the land starts reducing. So the river levels start rising up over the course of time. Now when you have this big major flood coming along, this major flood impacts much more than what it would have had the river bottom been a little bit lower. From degradation of the environment to failed engineering projects, A raft of human activities enhanced the 2010 floods. But of them all, the long-term burning of fossil fuels attracted the biggest portion of the blame. The intensity, northerly position, and persistence of the rainfall were all linked to anthropogenic climate change. 2010 was quite remarkable in many places around the world. The sea surface temperatures were very unusual throughout the tropics. The overheated Atlantic waters triggered a vigorous hurricane season. And this helped set up a strange circulation pattern in the atmosphere. The northern hemisphere jet stream began to wander. There are several components to the jet stream. The one we hear about the most, the polar jet, is a ribbon of air that flows west to east, and there are waves in the jet stream. Then along those waves that's where storm systems occur. The westerly winds push these systems across the globe. Sometimes those waves can get really amplified so they're very north-south. When that happens, the bottom of the wave, what we call the trough, can become very slow moving. So when you have a very amplified flow, you could get a storm stuck in one area and you could get a dry spell in what we call the ridges stuck in another area. And that's exactly what happened in 2010. This buckling of the jet stream 
carried the monsoon rains further north into Pakistan than normal. At the same time, Russia sweltered under a massive, stagnant, high-pressure system. They lasted for about a couple of months, enough to really cause major trouble in Russia, where it got extraordinarily hot and dry, wildfires broke out, uh, things got quite out of control, in fact. And then, not that far away, in fact, there were substantial floods over Pakistan. We found anomalous circulation patterns that brought warm, moist air from both the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal all the way up into the, into the region near uh, northwest India and Pakistan that then rose up the terrain and it eventually caused the floods that occurred throughout the month. Although the majority of deaths in Pakistan were due to the flash flooding, it was the persistence of the rain that displaced so many people. The Pakistan 2010 flood actually was more of a slow rise flood. What happens in many of the big flood and drought events that we see around the world. But again, there's some studies showing there's a somewhat greater tendency for that to occur in recent decades. There is evidence that over the last 60 years, the jet stream is the waviest it's been for centuries, favoring more of these systems that become stuck. A leading theory is that a warming Arctic is a major contributor. So one of the things that helps drive the jet stream is the Arctic and the Antarctic are these real cold reservoirs. And what causes the jet stream is the thermal difference between the north and the south. The temperature difference between these icy regions and the tropics drives the winds that form the jet streams. The Arctic is warming faster than anywhere on Earth. And in summer, much of the Arctic is now ice-free. It's lowering the temperature difference between the tropics and the poles. So rather than this real strong west-east jet stream pattern in the northern hemisphere, the fact that the Arctic isn't as dramatically cold as it used to be is allowing more of that wavy pattern. That's as the theory goes. There's still a lot of discussion and debate about it, but there's more and more scientists studying that idea. Like a lazy river, the jet stream is wandering all over the place. And this favors all sorts of unusual and persistent weather systems. From severe drought to unseasonal blizzards, to torrential rains that just won't go away. But there's another way global warming intensifies floods. Louisiana, on the southeast of the US, sits at the edge of the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. This is a state used to a good drenching. Southern Louisiana is a place that gets heavy rain. There's no doubt about it. But the rains that fell in 2016 were off the charts dumping as much as seven centimeters per hour in some parts. Baton Rouge bore the brunt of it. My entire life for just washed away. Hurts you to your heart to see him, you know, that happened to him, but that's what happened. It was a weak tropical depression that didn't have a strong circulation attached to it, but it had tremendous amounts of rainfall. There were some measurements along the coast, along the Gulf Coast, and they recorded the largest amount of moisture in the atmosphere that had ever been recorded in that area. And this is associated with quite warm conditions in the Gulf, and the moisture was coming out of the Gulf and just dumped a tremendous amount of water on the, on the ground in that region. At the same time, in the center of the US, a short wave trough was forming. This is an atmospheric disturbance that causes air to rise ahead of it. The trough drifted towards the Gulf of Mexico. Eventually, the two systems met and produced a double lift effect. 
the warm, moist air rose rapidly, then cooled before the rains came down. This is kind of what you associate with a very violent or vigorous thunderstorm uh, that you see with strong updrafts, uh, very high precipitation rates. Sometimes you have hail. Nearly 26 trillion liters of water were dumped on Louisiana in a week, three times more than during Hurricane Katrina. It was unprecedented in anyone's living memory. We actually lost everything in Katrina, came here, and 10 years later lost everything again. So I think when they started getting these tremendous amounts of rains day after day after day, the disaster was already unfolding around them before people and officials started realizing, wow, this is actually a lot worse than it first appeared it might be. But it wasn't just a once-in-a-lifetime flood. In terms of the past records, they were regarded at the time as one-in-a-thousand-year floods in some locations. But with climate change, these are not unexpected, but to many people, they are. The Amite River rose almost 1.5 meters above its previous record level. Here in the United States, many cities designed their systems with 50 or 100 years of flood record. That's not enough to tell us what the big ones are. And when you have very urbanized environments, that actually can contribute more to the flood as well, because pavement and development tend to inhibit the ability of water to soak into the ground. So cities are known to actually flood with less rain than rural areas. In the Louisiana floods, 13 people lost their lives. Most of them in cars. So in societies where cars are, are more prevalent, people are used to driving their cars and they, they feel quite safe in their cars. But really a car's just like a, a bubble of air, like a balloon. Ironically, most car deaths happen in the larger, heavier vehicles, as drivers presume them to be safe. So we ran a series of tests on a range of different cars. So a large four-wheel drive in 60 or 70 centimetres of water, the, the rear wheels will start floating. We were quite amazed at how little water it did take for, for those vehicles to become unstable. Once the water rises above the floor of the car, it will interact with a bubble of air in the cabin. For compact cars, this is not even knee height. Smaller cars will start floating in very shallow water depths of the order of 30 or 40 centimetres. Once you're floating, you go where the water goes, and usually it's water going over a road embankment or over the top of a bridge that lifts the car off and then pushes it off the embankment or off the bridge into deeper water. Roadways are completely flooded. You can't see any of the signage, uh, basically feeling your way through high water. In Louisiana, emergency services were overwhelmed with the volume of people needing rescue. So, the Cajun Navy stepped in. So the Cajun Navy is this group, predominantly of boat owners, who are from the U.S. Gulf Coast, who, after a number of major disasters, they have actually come together, they've taken their boats, they've mobilized, and they've gone out, and they've actually rescued people during these flooding disasters. We had a boat, so we're trying to do whatever we can in our time of crisis and disasters. The Cajun Navy formed during Hurricane Katrina and reactivated in the Louisiana floods and Hurricane Harvey, rescuing thousands of people. 
They actually used social media and they used other data sources to identify where stranded populations are located and so forth. And so the Cajun Navy really seems to be all about people coming together to help people. Before floodwaters had even subsided, media reports began to ask whether there was a link between the extreme flooding and climate change. To address the question, a rapid attribution study was launched using the best available observational data and climate simulations. They found that rising temperatures had almost doubled the likelihood of a disaster like the Louisiana floods. Most of the heat is ending up in the oceans, and this has consequences. It means the air above the oceans is warmer and the air is moister, and this then affects all storms. It affects storms because heat energy allows water molecules to break free of the surface tension and become water vapor or evaporate. The warmer it gets, the more water vapor can be transported. Let's say you're not putting any more water down on the surface, but you're just redistributing how it occurs. There could be areas that have long dry spells. And then where it does rain, because the oceans are warmer, they're pumping a little bit more moisture into the atmosphere. It can rain much more intensely than it had before. The scientific community has established that there is typically a 7% increase in the extreme rainfall that can occur with each degree rise in warming. This has resulted in extreme rainfalls across the world increasing. Coupled to this, the fact that we have more people in the world, these populations essentially are congregating more and more towards the cities. The cities lie near the rivers where the water lies. You have more people, more infrastructure assets being exposed to any flood damage, and these floods are more intense because you're having this much more rainfall coming down. Heated waters also provide the driving force for cyclones, which can help create severe flooding events, especially when they come in the middle of a wet season. Mozambique is an African nation on the southeast coast. It's a downstream country. Nine of Southeast Africa's major rivers, including the Zambezi, cross through Mozambique on their way to the ocean. It's one of the poorest countries in the world, and with a lack of irrigation infrastructure, most people live right on the waterways. Most settlements, wherever you are in the world, are nearby rivers and streams. A lot of farming also occurs on floodplains because of the soil that comes down the catchment and these floods is very rich and, and fertile for growing crops. So a lot of settlements are on river floodplains because of that reason as well. Whatever happens upstream, Mozambique suffers the consequences. Mozambique in the late fall of 1999 into January of 2000 had quite a bit of rain. And many of the rivers were already at or above flood stage. In fact, by the end of January, there had already been 700 deaths in Mozambique. Then on February 22nd, um, tropical cyclone Eline hit as if, you know, they didn't need something worse. And that was just something that the country couldn't deal with. Eileen just happened to be the longest lived cyclone on record. An extremely slow moving system that traveled more than 11,000 kilometers. It turned an already catastrophic flood into Mozambique's worst natural disaster in a century. The channels of the rivers were already full, the soil was already moist, um, the emergency services had already been stretched. On top of that, this is a, a very, what we call a hydrologically sensitive area. Any additional rain isn't going into the ground. Parts of the country that had never been flooded were now underwater. By the beginning of March, a million people were homeless. 
Mozambique, with only one functioning helicopter, used by the president, was severely underprepared. There are thousands of people out there who really need to be rescued, and the helicopters you see behind here are totally overwhelmed. Six South African Defense Force helicopters saved thousands of stranded people. The situation is really bad. It's perhaps the worst thing I've uh, seen in my entire life. As neighboring countries mobilized their forces to deliver more helicopters, boats, aid, and finances, Mozambique's own history of conflict came back to haunt its citizens. Once the most landmine-riddled country in the world, the government had made exhaustive efforts to clear the explosives. That now we're going to have a problem. Where they are the mines that have been washed out, nobody knows. Plastic-covered mines were carried away in the floods, creating new minefields where none had previously existed. As you see, this is a PMN that is with explosives and with the metal contamination, you know. Tracker dogs and survey teams were sent on a dangerous mission to locate the mines. As problems mounted, a health emergency deepened. You have inundation of farms, animals dying, livestock essentially becoming a part of that same water that again breeds diseases. You typically have gastroenteritis, you have waterborne diseases. You even have cases of malaria. Water becomes a breeding ground for mosquitoes and malaria. The problem when you have large amounts of displaced people, they tend to be crowded into certain areas where maybe they're not getting the proper nutrition, and then that just can make the, the whole situation of spreading disease and illness a, a greater. So it's, it's like one problem after another that keeps on happening, keeps on accumulating, because of this, you have a complete collapse of the health situation. By mid-August, Pakistan was also beginning to face a healthcare emergency. As the rains continued, a fifth of Pakistan was now underwater, an area roughly the size of Switzerland, Belgium and Austria combined. So in Pakistan, being a densely populated country and a fifth of their land is submerged during this flood, the fact that 20 million people were displaced is not a surprise. That's not something the country's gonna recover from very quickly. Of the millions affected, many were in desperate need of food, medical care, and most of all, clean water. Many became incredibly angry at what they perceived to be a lack of response by the government. Many of the bridges were broken, a lot of the dams were flooded. A lot of the lowland regions where people live uh, were completely flooded. So getting the aid to those, those populations required air support as opposed to uh, ground level support, which brings a lot of challenges. Although 30,000 troops were sent in, aid was patchy and inadequate. Soon, the first cases of cholera began to appear. Cholera is often a fatal disease caused by eating or drinking bacterially contaminated water. Crowding exacerbates the problem as the bacteria is spread. But even more than that, when you have a flood sweep through, especially in an urban area, you have things like sewer lines that break and other toxic material that gets into the water. And so water becomes unsafe and diseases can spread that way too. So you have both the insect-borne diseases and the stuff associated with sanitation being disrupted. <laughs> Okay. 
In a survey of flood survivors, it was found that the vast majority of the villages were getting their drinking water mainly from flood and rainwaters, or rivers and springs. So the key word here is vulnerability. So you could have a very major weather event, like a flood or a tornado, that either impacts a low population area where no one lives, or impacts a population that's very accustomed to these and prepared for it, and so its impacts will be small. Then you could have a severe or even a moderate weather event, like a flood, that impacts a population that has substandard housing that can collapse very quickly, that have no resources to fall back on if their farms are destroyed, or that are elderly or disabled and can't evacuate very quickly. Pakistan is, of course, an example of a country that has some vulnerable populations, and with the heavy rain they got, it was truly catastrophic. At the end of the 2010 floods, the official Pakistan death toll stood at close to 2,000 people. A figure dramatically lower than the millions left facing a devastating future. After the, the rains ended, there was still a humanitarian disaster where there were diseases and there were you know, food issues and all kinds of problems that, that came with this massive flooding event. In terms of the size of the population affected, it was six times greater than the 2010 quake in Haiti. And nine times greater than the Boxing Day tsunami of 2004. Floods destroyed many cotton crops. Electricity shortages paralyzed the textile industry. Food prices surged Families lost their loved ones, livestock, homes, lands, dowries, and goods. For some people, life would never be the same again. The devastation caused by extreme flooding shows how fragile we all are. The predicted increase in the frequency and severity of severe weather events, coupled with an exploding population, may test the world's capacity to cope. In the face of both in combination, is there anything that can be done to better prepare ourselves? The first thing is to stop burning fossil fuels in particular and transition to a very low carbon economy. The other option is go back to engineering. Now, engineering options are expensive. They cause a lot of disruption. But given the options that exist with us, I don't see what else can be done. The Western countries that have put most of the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere have a moral and ethical responsibility to help developing countries to develop the technology and to, to build that, that resilience. Even in disadvantaged countries like Pakistan, huge change is possible where there is political will. Since the flooding in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, its government launched the Billion Tree Tsunami Project in 2014 as a challenge to global warming. It has already overshot its target of a billion new trees by restoring and planting 350,000 hectares of forest. These trees are also helping to secure river embankments, as well as heavily degraded slopes. It is the largest ever eco-project in the country, and such a source of national pride that many other provinces are considering the same. Before 2014, it was just an idea. So I think there will be major changes uh, in the future. The question is how quickly we're going to get there.